almost all Christian groups, communion is a symbol of unity. At least it's supposed to be. But the truth is, it's one of the most divisive issues in all of Christendom. There are ongoing arguments over what communion is and does, when it should happen, who should participate, and how exactly it should be done. There's lots of room for disagreement and preference in those things, but I want to stick to the basics because here at Followers, we take communion every single week, and it's important to know why it's essential and how to get the most out of it as God intends. So let's start with where the word and practice come from and the Old Testament roots of communion. The term communion comes from the Latin word communio, which means sharing in common. And that came from the Greek word koinonia, which also means fellowship or sharing. Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16. He says, when we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we're one body. So union is at the heart of communion. Among Anglicans, Catholics, Presbyterians, and Lutherans, communion is called the Eucharist, which is from the Greek word for thanksgiving. The focus is on giving thanks for the sacrifice of Jesus. And among more evangelical churches like the Baptists and Pentecostals, communion is often referred to as the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table, and that harks back to the final time Jesus shared the Passover with his disciples, just before his death. The Passover is where everything begins. About 1,200 years before Jesus is born, the people of Israel are slaves in Egypt and have been for about 400 years. Pharaoh treats them horribly and refuses to let them go when Moses tells him God demands their release. As outlined in Exodus 7 to 11, this sets up a showdown between God and the Egyptian king. 10 plagues afflict the land, including the Nile River turning into blood. A plague of frogs, another of locusts, and a plague of darkness and still Pharaoh refuses to relent. So Exodus 12 says God tells his people to put the blood of a lamb or young goat on the doorposts of their homes, because that night he will pass through the land and the firstborn of every Egyptian family will die. But he says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you. We're told that when Pharaoh's own son is taken, he finally lets the people go. And from then on, the feast of Passover is held by the Hebrews every year to remind them of how God spared them from slavery and took them to freedom. In the New Testament, Jesus celebrates the Passover with his 12 disciples just before his crucifixion and he uses it to draw parallels between freedom from the bondage of Egyptian slavery and the freedom he will bring us from the bondage of sin. But to fully understand what he does, it might help to have some background. A while ago, I showed a video during communion showing the connection between Passover and the Last Supper. It bears repeating with some new information. And so we've got the sprigs of parsley. Sprig of parsley, a symbol of life, and also of the hyssop that was used to smear the blood on the doorposts, dipped into the salt water, representing the tears of the children of Israel because of the slavery in Egypt, and parsley with salt water. <laughs> 
The brownish stuff is actually sweet and it represents the mortar. So we know that they built two whole cities for the pharaohs, it says in scripture. It's sweet, generally this is interpreted that even though you work hard, hard work is actually good for humans. And then finally we have the bitter herbs. And it's supposed to be hot enough that when you taste it, it makes you cry. Again, this idea of relating to the children of Israel and Egypt and their slavery. We taste it with the bitter herbs, which is very important because the bitter herbs are actually commanded to be eaten. And so we take some of the bitter herbs. Hopefully this is wow. sharp enough to make us cry a little bit. Wow. And finally, the shank of a lamb. And this reminds us, of course, of the original lamb in Egypt that the children of Israel slaughtered and used the hyssop to smear the blood on the doorposts and the lentils of their houses. And also then the perpetual sacrifice that was supposed to go on every year at the temple or the tabernacle to remember every year sacrifices were made at the Passover in remembrance of the original Passover in Egypt. And we see him taking these elements and renewing them, you right. might say. Right. And so he redefines the cup and he says, this is reflexive, this is pointing to me. And the sacrifice of the lamb, the shank bone, right? Mm -hmm. I am the lamb. As John identifies Jesus, of course, the lamb, early, of God. the lamb of God, the bread from heaven, right? And he's been reframing this symbol of bread, yeah. the bread of heaven, the manna from heaven, the fact that he has come from the Father to give life to the world. The cup is pretty primary. There's four cups of wine that we drink. Right. And they're based actually on the text in Exodus that's full of I wills. God says, I will take you out of slavery. I will free you. I will take you unto myself, etc. And it's interesting that traditionally the third cup after the meal is the cup of salvation. And it seems that Jesus picks up after the meal the cup and establishes what we call communion with the cup of salvation, which is what he's about to accomplish that night and the next day on his death on the cross. And so that's very significant, the symbol of the vine. And in Jewish tradition, wine has a few meanings. First, it's a symbol of joy and of God's provision, but also, especially because of the color, it's also associated a bit with blood. And so this thing that Jesus does, I believe that is already established as having a connection to blood. Then we also have this interesting setup with the unleavened bread. We have three pieces of bread that are separated by linen. And this is a specific thing that's related to the Passover celebration. And so we have a very curious tradition. It's not really clearly explained. And that is we take the third of the matzahs that is in here. And at a certain point in the service, we break it and we take half and put it back together between the other two pieces. Again, this was the middle piece. And then we take half and we wrap it in another piece of linen. And this is hidden away by the master of the banquet who's doing the presenting. And the children go on a treasure hunt after dinner is over. And this has to be found. He will redeem it either by money or a gift and it'll be eaten as a final dessert. Even if mother created all kinds of dessert, unleavened, of course, this will be eaten at the end afterwards and nothing basically else will be eaten that night. Everyone, of course, has stuffed a big meal. This is very significant. It has a curious name, afikoman, which seems to be a Greek word. One possible meaning is I have come. This is curious. This is hidden away and then is brought back, redeemed, and then it is partaken of. And so, as a Messianic Jew, I believe that this is a wonderful symbol for Jesus. Notice he's in, in the middle, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perhaps, right? His human nature, he dies, and he's wrapped in linen and buried away. But his eternal nature cannot die, and so it remains with God. And God resurrects him, and Jesus takes the bread, and he blesses it, and he gives it to the disciples, says, take and eat of this, this is my body broken for you. And we see this connection with the New Testament, very beautiful, because all the other explanations for this in Jewish tradition leave something to be desired. Okay, now let's look at the Lord's Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. 
Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When the early church takes flight, communion is a cornerstone because it reminds the believers of who they are, how they're supposed to live, and where they're going. Acts 2 says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe fell over them all and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple every day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. The Lord's Supper is mentioned twice for emphasis and sharing is mentioned four times. Communion was part of that. It's a deep sharing with God and his people. But it didn't look like it looks today. At least in some areas, it was accompanied by a full meal. The early church called it the love feast. And we get a glimpse of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. When you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper for some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. So some go hungry while others get drunk. Do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? Well, I certainly will not praise you for that. For I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks to God. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new agreement between God and his people, one sealed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So we can clearly see the purposes of communion, remembrance and relationship both with God and other believers. Now by remembrance, the Bible is not talking about simply recalling what happened at the cross and the tomb. Real remembrance involves serious reflection and personal evaluation about where we are in our walk with Jesus. It means taking an honest look at how the last week has gone, confessing our sins to God, expressing gratitude for all Jesus did for us at Calvary, and recommitting our lives to Him. And just think about how different all that is to just going on autopilot and absent-mindedly taking the bread and cup while you think about what you're going to have for lunch. And that shallow thinking is exactly what Paul goes on to talk about in 1 Corinthians 11. He adds, anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That's why you should examine yourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. So when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you're really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. Now, when some people see those words, they sometimes decline communion, usually after falling flat on their face because of some besetting sin. They don't think they're worthy. They're worthy. 
But that can't possibly be what Paul was referring to because Scripture makes it absolutely clear nobody is worthy of what Jesus did on the cross. We are saved only by the grace and mercy of God and not our own performance. So what did Paul mean? Well, there are several possibilities. Some think Paul was simply referring to the overindulgence of those who were eating all the food at the love feast and getting drunk while ignoring the needs of others. But some think he meant we take communion unworthily if we refuse to admit willful, unconfessed sin to God. Some say we're unworthy if we take communion without resolving ongoing conflict with a brother or sister, because in the context of the passage, Paul chides the Corinthians for divisions among them. And others say we participate unworthily if we treat communion lightly and fail to seriously recognize the torture of Jesus that took away our sin. In other words, when we take his sacrifice for granted. Just imagine what it must feel like for God when, after giving his son on the cross, we give that just a passing thought, then spend the rest of the time daydreaming, talking, or treating communion like an empty, unimportant ritual. We can understand how that might bring judgment upon us. Communion does not mean sinning is okay, but nor should we decline to participate in communion if we're struggling with our sin. Now, if you're unconcerned about your sin, that's an entirely different matter. But if you want to overcome it, you need to participate in communion because that's where we find new strength for the battle. We will only ever be worthy because Jesus invites us to the table. And that's where we should be thinking about what he did for us on the cross to find new resolve and gratitude. We do that by seeing past the bread that symbolizes the tortured body of Jesus broken for us and the cup that represents his blood. They're just a means by which we share in his death and resurrection by commemorating them. Hey, look, when you go to lunch with somebody, we know it's not primarily about the food. It's about relationship, communication, and sharing. In the same way, communion gets us to a deeper level of intimacy and relationship with God and one another. And in turn, that helps us get to the point where sin is no longer running our lives. It really is about going deeper in a way you can't find anywhere else. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, Paul says that every time we have communion, we proclaim to ourselves and those who see us the death of Jesus that saves us from our sin. We also proclaim his resurrection, which is the physical evidence of that forgiveness. And then Paul says we should examine ourselves when we're at the table. We need to examine our motives, our current faithfulness to God, and our relationship with each other. That last point is why we take communion together. It's not just about obedience and commitment, it's about unity and community. We're to strengthen each other by sharing the elements together. In John 13, the writer connects the Passover and Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. He teaches them humility, saying that although he's the master, he's willing to do a servant's job and wash their stinky feet. And then he tells them to have the same attitude with each other. Part of communion is recognizing our own sin before God, which will make it a whole lot easier for us to be patient, gentle, and loving with each other. In other words, humility. And in case you don't know, many Mennonite brethren and Adventist churches still have the love feast and foot washing. And on the other extreme, the Lord's Supper is not observed at all by Quakers, Christian scientists, or the Salvation Army, mostly because they think it puts too much emphasis on the external ritual instead of inner transformation. But that's clearly not true when communion is done right. By the way, there are two kinds of communion in churches, 
The first is close communion, which restricts it to church members and baptized believers. And then there's open communion, which makes it available to everyone, including kids and those who have not made a commitment to Christ. At Followers, all are welcome. We want people to take communion seriously, but we also believe God meets people where they are. So just imagine inviting someone to your house, and then when supper time rolls around, you say, well, you can stay, but you can't eat because you're not family. In my view, if we're going to restrict communion to those who understand it completely and practice it correctly, we'd have to exclude a whole lot of Christians too. So to be clear, communion is not about routine or ritual. It's about relationship. So it's absolutely meaningless if we're just going through the motions and putting in no serious thought. But understand that your emotions might change from week to week, depending on what kind of week it's been. What I mean is that the Lord's Supper doesn't always have to be solemn and sober. Sure, the crucifixion of Jesus was horrific, but that's just the first part of the story. At the end, there's victory, incredible joy, and hope. So sometimes the emphasis will be on repentance and contrition, or recommitment, or gratitude and thankfulness for spiritual gains during the week. The important thing is to be engaged and to make the personal application, but also be mindful of others. Because even if you've had a good week, maybe others have not and are struggling. So don't talk to those around you about things that have nothing to do with communion. Don't joke with the servers. Use the occasion to quietly express love or gratitude for someone around you, provided they're not deep in thought. Ponder the communion meditation and apply it to your own life while the emblems are passed around, or meditate on the lyrics of the song that's playing. Remember, reflect, reevaluate, and recommit to God and your brothers and sisters. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. At this table, you're never going to walk away physically stuffed. But done correctly, communion can leave your spirit absolutely full. May the Lord bless you abundantly.